Hi, everyone. We're so excited to be hosting another September Summit this evening. I'm Jordan Dakin, Beyond Type 1's Director of Programs, and I will hand it off momentarily to this amazing group. But I just want to thank you all for joining, those of you who are in the Zoom, those of you who are on Facebook Live. As a reminder, if you have questions, we might be able to take some later in the discussion. So feel free to drop them into the chat or in the comments. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to hand you off to this group. Felissa, feel free to take it away. Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to have you here. I'm so excited for tonight's discussion. Welcome to September Summits. We're excited to be here talking about racial and ethnic disparities in diabetes care. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors, September Summits is presented by JDRF's Beyond Type 1 Alliance and are made possible with the support from OneDrop, Roche Diabetes Care, and Xeris Pharmaceuticals. Tonight, I'll be moderating the discussion. My name is Felicity Rose. I've been living with diabetes for nine years. I was misdiagnosed living with type 2 diabetes for the past eight years. I just recently celebrated my first LATA diabetes diversity this month. So this is extra special conversation. Um, this is an extra special conversation for me. I run a blog at Diagnose Not Defeated. That is my motto. And I'm also the founder of Black Diabetic Info. I'm going to move on and let our guests introduce themselves. We'll start with Manny, then Sharice, then Courtney, then Michelle, please introduce yourselves to our audience. Uh, Manny Hernandez, a uh, pleasure to be here. I have been living with diabetes now since 2002, so that makes uh, almost exactly 18 years. Uh, like Felissa, uh, I was also uh, misdiagnosed at first and uh, lived, uh, uh, you know, with a type two based treatment uh, for several months until I was diagnosed as having type 1 diabetes. I'm originally from Venezuela. We came to the United States in 2000. So uh, yeah, it's a, a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hi, my name is Cherie Shockley. I was diagnosed with latent autoimmune diabetes and those like Felissa and Manny, which is actually interesting that we are saying that in a row. But uh, in 2004, um, I am originally from Kansas City, Missouri, not Venezuela. And um, I am happy to be here. Hey everybody, Courtney Taylor. I am the mother of Chase, who's 12 years old. Uh, Chase was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2011 when he was three years old. So we've been a type 1 family for eight years now. How long did he have? Yep, eight years. Um, he just had his diversity in August. We also run a nonprofit, Chase Away Diabetes Foundation, that was birthed from Chase's idea about uh, raising awareness and influencing advocacy for other kids that are like him. So. Nice to be here with everybody. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Litchman. I'm a nurse practitioner and diabetes researcher at the University of Utah. I don't live with diabetes, but have several family members that have both type one and type two diabetes. And I'm excited to be on the panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So as you see tonight, we have a great round of panelists. I'll be posing questions and anyone can chime in and answer. So the first question is, what have you personally experienced in terms of facing the healthcare system here in America? Um, have you felt marginalized? Do you feel that at some point your racial or ethnic identity influenced a particular moment? So anything that our audience could benefit from hearing your personal story or experience? You can chime in if, if you want, Felisa. Um, I would, when, when I first saw this question as we were uh, meeting as a panel, one of the things that came to mind was uh, when I was first diagnosed in 2002, uh, I was relatively new uh, to the U.S., just a you know a 
under a couple of years here. And uh, I did not n understand that there was this concept of pre-existing conditions as something that uh, you, you were uh, excluded from getting coverage uh, if you were to apply as an individual. So I applied for uh, a, a policy and received a letter saying that everything that pertained to diabetes was excluded. And I was like, well, what do you mean excluded? That's the whole point. That's, that's why I'm looking for coverage. Uh, I, I subsequently understood what that was about. And uh, although, uh, I mean, I have been since fortunate to, to have coverage through a you know, succession of employers, like I, I felt incredibly thankful for when the Affordable Care Act passed. And I'm, I'm definitely concerned, I should say, about uh, its current prospects, uh, given the degree to which it is under so much attack. Thank you, anyone else? Um, I'll share. So my earlier, Chase has been going to the same um, diabetes center at CHOP since he was diagnosed. Um, so, you know, it's like our second home now. But our first experiences going to his endocrinology appointments, um, I've definitely had many experiences where because I automatically, I already look younger than what I am because I'm a black woman um, and I'm coming in with my young black son who is living with this chronic illness, there are already preconceived notions about, you know, how we're managing it or what's happening or why we're there. And um, I'm a super detailed person. So I will come to the appointments with my notes and already having, you know, uh, thoughts and ideas and theories about why, you know, his blood sugar is this way or what's happening with this and um, already having action steps written down and ready and articulating that and advocating for him. And it was automatically dismissed um, because, you know, you know, do you really know what you're talking about? And, you know, I would get the either, mm, we're not really sure about that or uh, really shocked at how detailed I was and how knowledgeable I was about it. And those experiences, it happened beyond, um, you know, going to the endocrinology appointments, but with uh, in other areas when it came to his diabetes care. And it's something that, you know, we see even beyond healthcare. I mean, as a Black woman in America, even we see it today, you know, we're invisible, we are voiceless, and no one's really ready to take us seriously. So I've definitely experienced that. It's gotten better over the years, because like I said, we've been going to CHOP for so long, so we're used to us now. But it's definitely been an experience early on um, when he was diagnosed. Thank you. Cherise? I was gonna say for me, when I was diagnosed with diabetes, I did not. And it could be because when I was introduced into, well, diabetes came into my life, um, I was in the military system. So we had access to very good doctors and I have never experienced uh, any racial bias because of the color of my skin. Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, as for me, um... I would say there was one time when I felt like I was just slapped in the face. And that was when I went to have an appointment with a podiatrist. So I was riding around town. I had an appointment with a podiatrist and I passed this building and it had like the same name. Like it wasn't Springfield, but I'm just gonna say it was like Springfield Podiatry. And I went in there and I was like, excuse me, is this the same Springfield podiatry that's located in another town 30 minutes away? And they were like, yeah, we're associated. And I was like, well, I have an appointment at Springfield podiatry, but it's the one in the, in the neighboring town. I would love to be able to come here, you know, 10 minutes from my home for the appointment. So this is me, you know, I'm, I'm totally focused on my plantar speciitis, right? And then the woman says, we're not taking any Medicaid patients here. And, and I was like, um, what's Medicaid? You know, 
Because like in that moment, I just felt like she just slapped me in the face. She just ran me up and down, right? Um, and yes, I know what Medicaid is, but I wanted her to tell me why she assumed that I was on Medicaid. So I said, what's Medicaid? And looked at her. And then she's like, oh, uh, um, what kind of insurance do you have? And I said, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Oh, um, I'll get you in an appointment. Just like that had an appointment. Um, so one of the things that I realized, because I've also had people assume because I'm a black woman who was living with a type two diabetes diagnosis that I knew about these things, that I apparently had a relative, a mom, a grandmother, or someone who had diabetes and I should know what to do. I even had a healthcare provider tell me that my family was lying. Someone had to have diabetes. Um, but in these moments, I realized that I had never gone to any doctor. I had never had an issue. And then my diabetes diagnosis meant that I was seeing a lot of doctors in a short amount of time. So I was having these experiences back to back that were just um, shocking, to say the least. So I would say the, the Medicaid one at the podiatrist was Ooh. probably the one that I would remember forever. Horrible. Michelle, do you have any stories from people you've seen that by the time they get to you, they feel relieved? <laughs> um, I can share that, um, you know, several of you have talked about being misdiagnosed. And um, I, I saw that so often when I was in primary care. So I've had a couple of jobs in endocrinology, but also in family practice specializing in diabetes. And when I was in family practice, um, I was assigned to see everybody with an A1C over a certain level, just um, they had an opportunity to see me. And I was probably um, properly diagnosing people with LADA um, probably at least six times a month when I first started. So it was pretty, um, it was pretty common. And I think that people have some assumptions when we think about type one diabetes. And I think that there's younger, but also I think based on the color of uh, someone's skin, we assume type two diabetes, even though it's not. And so, um, or it may not be. And so I think that um, misdiagnosis is common. I also think that um, provision of care is definitely different. So um, just kind of thinking about some of my colleagues and um, how often certain things are offered, even just simple diabetes education um, a referral to a diabetes educator um, happens probably less often when someone is a person of color um, or especially if they have a language barrier. And so I think that we're definitely seeing that in the healthcare system. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I have a question about how we trust healthcare providers. This is just giving us a, a radius. So, we're going to do thumbs up and you have thumbs down and everything in between. So if you could just, <laughs> if you could just share again, uh, do you feel you could trust healthcare providers and you have again, all of this, just let me see where you are. Awesome. So oh, that's good. The majority of us are thumbs up. I'm not yeah. sideways, but you know where yeah. I am. Um, it depends. I've had some great, great, great um, experiences. And I think the people who have given me the best experiences are the ones who are interested in me as a person, right? So when you ask about my goals in life and you want to make sure that I live long enough to experience those things, then I think it's a win all, all around. Um, Sharice, she said you didn't have any um, experiences um, like that. Do you feel that you've been always given the appropriate treatment and care? I think the difference is for me is um, my mom was a direct is a director of community relations at uh, um, Inner City Health Center. So I grew up around the health system, and I grew up around the under resourced communities and underserved communities. So when I learned how to, how to advocate for my health at a very young age, even before I had diabetes. And the reason why I gave you this thumbs up 
is because as a person whose husband has spoke for me to have the health care that I have, I have the right to find me a new doctor when something's not right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So for me, if the relationship isn't right and I stay and I'm not getting the care that I need, that's partially my fault because I have the right to change my healthcare provider. And I know a lot of people don't know that they do have that right. No matter what type of insurance you have, it may be some hurdles where you have to get permission to do it through your insurance plan, but I have the right. So for me, my care has always been good because when it's not, I leave. Yeah, yeah. For, I, I uh, put a, a thumbs like kinda in the middle, but for the, those same reasons, because for me, my trusting in the healthcare professionals and it's endocrinologists, primary school nurses, it's for their reason. It depends on whether I've seen that the ones that I can trust the most are the ones that listen to what I'm saying, that believe what I'm saying, that they trust that I know my child's body. And they also understand that their years of medical school, their years and numbers of patients that they've seen does not trump my experience and my years as being his mom. And those are the ones that, the ones who actually trust that are the ones that I can trust the most. And because I advocate so hard, because, and again, beyond just endocrinologists, even with school nurses, with staff members at schools who engage with my child and help to manage his diabetes. If I don't trust them, like Sharice said, if I don't trust them, then they're out it's because I only have one of him. <laughs> and if something goes wrong, I cannot replace him. You cannot replace them. So that's yeah. why I put it in the middle because like, it depends. But once I do not trust them, absolutely not. And I think that that's important, especially exactly what Sharice said. It's important that everybody knows if you, if there's anything that you're not comfortable with, that you don't, you don't trust your professional, figure it out and change them because your, your health matters most. Manny, were you like that? Were you out always advocating for yourself? So I, I feel very fortunate in that uh, my, my first experience with a healthcare system uh, after being diagnosed uh, was one that uh, where, where my uh, primary care physician we tried, we worked together. I felt like we were partners. We were, I felt as, as, as an equal, right? We were working on this together and, and I trusted him and he trusted me to, to part of the point. Like he was listening and we were, I mean, I was living in Phoenix at the time. I was trained for a half marathon at the time, the only one I've run in my life, honestly. And uh, uh, I, that, that, extra amount of training I was doing was certainly helping with my blood glucose levels like big time, no surprise. When I was done with that race, uh, I went back to more of my average, you know, lifestyle. And, and, and that's when it hit us both. Like this is, uh, it, it, what we're doing, this metformin based treatment is not working. So, uh, for him to get to the point where he said, I don't know what else to try. I thought it was very powerful. Uh, and and uh, b- because there is so much, I, I mean, like, quite frankly, like healthcare professionals have to learn so much to get to the point where they can begin seeing patients that uh, for him to get to that point and say, I don't know what else to try. I'm going to refer you to an endocrinologist was very powerful. So I, th- I think it was like a very, uh, you know, humbling experience as, as part of my introduction to, to the, the system and, and in a way set me up to, uh, in a different, through a different path than Charisse's, but like to begin advocating for myself because I came to realize that, you know, healthcare professionals as prepared and as passionate as they are for, for the, the trade uh, don't necessarily have all the answers. So it is hugely important that I become as educated and knowledgeable about my condition as I can so I can stand up for myself when and if I need to. Uh, and in one instance where uh, when I had to do that, it was less so about the healthcare professional uh, who was actually a champion alongside 
me and more about the system, we had transitioned to from, uh, I don't remember, it was like probably one of the blues to uh, another, uh, uh, you know, uh, health plan. I won't go into the name to like, that, it's besides the point, but the point is that they, they were like a whole closed system where the, the plan, the clinic, the pharmacy, all the specialists were inside of this entity. And as a matter of principle, for example, they, they were very restrictive about who they would allow to get on a CGM extremely restrictive to the point where like uh, I, I, I came in wearing a CGM already and it was like a huge battle to be grandfathered in and were it not for my nurse practitioner who went to bat for me and, and helped uh, make the case, uh, I probably would have been uh, declined, which would have, was, was, you know, a little ridiculous. So Overall, my experience has been very positive, and I have found uh, healthcare professionals to 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 be on on, on my team. Uh, I I recognize that that is not necessarily everyone's experience. Okay, um, I just like to say I was not like any of you. I did not start off advocating for myself. Um, I was in the hospital, and I went with whatever doctor they told me. And it was just through a series of experiences, um, many of which were, were not so good, that got me to a place where I said, if I don't leave feeling good, then I'm gonna ask for a new physician. So I think the message that you have the ability to ask for a new physician should be clear because I could tell you it wasn't clear for me. I thought I just had to stick with whomever they gave me. Um, Michelle, I have a question for you. Do you mind telling us a little bit about how you practice cultural competence? Yeah, so for me, just because my mom doesn't speak English and several of my family members don't, I start with language. I wanna make sure that whoever is coming in, um, if they need an interpreter, that they have the interpreter because if you can't understand, uh, if there's no real dialogue between people, then I think that's number one, that's the, that's the biggest problem. So language is key. Um, if you have language, it doesn't necessarily mean you've understood the culture though. So, um, you know, I think asking questions is really, really important. So help me understand um, what it is that you eat. And for me personally, I tend to go through, um, especially when I'm first meeting somebody to go through a diet history, like tell me what an average week looks like. And if there are foods that I don't understand that I don't know, um, I ask more questions, I look them up. I look, sometimes we Google pictures so I can better understand what's going on. Um, and so I think that just simply asking people, what does your day look like? What does your, what does your food look like over a week? Who lives at home with you? Um, I think that is a, a, a nice start. When you think about culture, you don't want to make assumptions. So, you know, there's this assumption that, um, you know, all Asians are stoic. Well, are they? Are they really? And so I don't want people to be making assumptions. And I think that's really, really critical. So if you're not making assumptions, you need to be asking questions. Uh, I'd love to elaborate on what Michelle just said, because I think in, in the way of uh, uh, assumptions uh, in food, uh, I think uh, Latinos are a prime example, right? So, uh, I mean, there's there's this thing about putting all Latinos in one bucket, right? So I'm Latino, and like uh, you know, this guy from Mexico is Latino, and that gal from from Chile is Latina, and like, and that's true. Uh, however, when it comes to to things that pertain to culture and food habits, and, and it, it, we we couldn't be more different. I mean, there are some common staples for sure, but there's like, if you were to talk to uh, someone with Argentinian roots or uh, about their, their, you know, they gotta, you gotta lay off on, on, on the burritos. It's like, what are you talking about? We, I mean, we don't eat burritos. Like, so it's not, not even close to part of our a typical food. So I, I think it's so powerful what Michelle is saying about really just like, being humble, you know, like at first starting to ask questions and trying to understand what, 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 and, and, and even 
within a certain like uh, entity or, or regional identity, it doesn't mean that you're if you're from Venezuela or from Mexico or from Cuba that you, you all you eat are arepas or or tacos or or, or like it, 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 there's there's something to be said about each person as an individual and being treated as such. And it's funny, Manny, that you actually mentioned that because everybody thinks that all black people like fried chicken and watermelon. And that's not the case. All black people don't like watermelon and fried chicken. And when we live in, just because we live in the United States, there still are black people who are different and cultures are different in the yeah. South and the North and the East and the West. So the first thing that people say, and it drives me nuts is fried chicken. And I like fried chicken, but that doesn't mean Felissa or Courtney, they're gonna like fried chicken. So like you said, the key is to understand that individual person, treat the person to learn what and how the foods that they like and the activities that, that they like to do. So that's, that's very key. I agree. We're going to pause now because our chat in the Facebook live is lit up. So Jordan, do we have any questions from the chat? Hi, Felissa. I'm looking through and there's just mostly a lot of love um, <laughs> because you guys are amazing naturally. Um, so yeah, I think one of the main questions we had was about cultural competency, um, which you guys already answered. So I think, Felissa, if you want to keep charging ahead on some of the other questions you have, um, I can report back later with any others. Okay, thank you. This is so nice. I wish you had, I had you every day in my life, Jordan. You could just come in. So now let's talk about monetary resources. Do you feel as though you have had an experience where there's been a disparity based upon economics? Like, again, for me, I feel like the Medicaid comment was layered, right? Because that is um, an economic. Um, thing. And so we talked about language a little bit. So do you feel that um, the healthcare system um, has any, I guess, marginalized based upon um, economics in addition to racial, ethnicity, and also language? Anyone? I can share um, from a healthcare provider standpoint, when I'm trying to prescribe like a diabetes technology, if the diabetes technology is only in English, you've already lost that battle with trying to get somebody on diabetes technology. So I think that um, having diabetes technology in um, different languages is really, really important. And if you think about, you know, an insulin pump or CGM, there's only certain words said. It's not like there's new words that are being said all of the time. So it, it, it shouldn't be too hard to recode for, for certain languages. I think that also um, just from seeing how, um, seeing my colleagues and just um, kind of knowing the healthcare system that I'm in, I think that um, there's assumptions made that people can't afford certain things. And it's not just technology, it's medications too. And so sometimes it's, um, you know, do we prescribe that because we're just going to assume that they can't afford it. and. Um, and I think that's problematic. I think that you bring options to people and then let people make decisions on what they think works for them. I agree. Um, I found out when I was pregnant, I was living in Abu Dhabi and the um, Freestyle Libre had been approved for years, like before it came to the States. Um, while I was pregnant, I had many, many, many hypos like the amount of hypos I had changed the way my husband and I navigated things. So for example, I couldn't be in the bathroom longer than 15 minutes. He had to come knock to, you know, make sure I'm still alive um, because I had a, a lot of hypos. So I happened to discover that the Freestyle Libre had been available in the UAE for like years, right? So I say to my endo, like, why did you never mention the Freestyle Libre to me? Um, because I would have known about my hypos. And she said it was expensive. That was her answer. And I, I, 
again, I just keep getting slapped in the face. I'm <laughs> I turn the other cheek, I guess, but I just couldn't believe it because I thought to myself, like, as a woman pregnant with her first child, I would have done anything, anything, yeah. you know, and, and that was her answer. It was expensive. So she never mentioned it, you know, horrible. And I, it's, it's, it's the, I, that right there is disgusting because as my doctor, like, even if it is expensive, even if you know for a fact that I cannot afford it, you also know that there are numerous resources that can help me figure it out. And like, it's your job to help to advocate for me and to connect me with diabetes educators and social workers and everybody. So to just say, oh, well, it was expensive and to dismiss me just like that, that's not okay. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, she's no longer my endocrinologist. Good. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I think that for me, even though, so I'm gonna back up a little bit. So to say that I haven't experienced any, I probably have, but it's so, and I know this sounds bad and I'm gonna be honest, it's so normal to hear people talk about, mm -hmm. oh, you can't do this or you're this or just the assumptions that come out of people's mouths because of the color of your skin. Yep. It just becomes normal, right? So for me, to say that I haven't, I probably have. And it just goes from to, oh my gosh, to this is normal, I'm used to it. My mom taught me to rise above it and don't yeah. stoop to their level. So I wanna make sure I say that because as people of color, we're so used to hearing comments mm -hmm. and the passive mm -hmm. remarks that we just go with the flow and that's not okay. So I wanted to bring that up as well. Great point. Uh, to, to build on this, uh, I mean, I, I feel sadly uh, diabetes is generally speaking the poster child of, of, of disparities, right? And, and, uh, and, and because of that, of, of like inequitable access, right? And so whether you're talking about insulin or, or uh, access to technologies, uh, I, I mean, it, I, I think uh, it is uh, gut wrenching is, is, incredibly uh, disappointing that uh, living in a, in a country that is as rich as the U.S. is, that we, we still have this, you know, depending on where, where you're born, where you live, who you work for, or whether you're employed, uh, means that you're going to have a better chance or not to, to have better health outcomes, to, mm -hmm. to make it right? It, 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 as it, it, like, I, I was looking up earlier, uh, the, the, the figures, 40% of COVID-19 deaths, are people with diabetes, 40%. Wow. That is, that is unbelievable. That is unbelievable. And of course, a huge percentage of mm -hmm. deaths as well are minorities. Yep. So, I mean, I mean, we are, we're doing some fundamental things so wrong, getting them so backward that, I mean, that, that is why I made the comment I made in the beginning, because I feel that one of the safety nets that has been in place now for, for years through the ACA is being challenged. It's like, how come, how dare anyone challenge the uh, the access that has been available to the people that have you know with all its shortcomings like instead of that like how do we extend it so that it's truly universal so there's no one left out so that you have you don't have to choose between rent and insulin you know mm -hmm. between right. living and dying ultimately because that's what it comes down to right well, and I was going to add a comment, you know, some people who, you know, who have insurance, they have a choice of who they can see as a provider, but I see this so often where insurance coverage changes. So you may have still the same insurance, but they've decided to panel with different people or that you still have the same job, but now they offer a different insurance. And so now the panel has changed 
And so your choices change. So that's one issue with insurance, but also there are so many people who just don't have insurance and they don't have choices because they don't, um, there are only certain clinics that will provide care for them. And so I just think that um, while there are a, a good, um, good percentage of people that do have choices, there are so many still that do not. Wow, I am stunned by that 40%. I'm not surprised. I know, I know that sounds bad, but just like I said earlier, I mean, if we are surprised by that number, we haven't been waking up yet. I mean, if you just look at the history, I mean, Felissa, you know, we've had this conversation mm -hmm. many times is that the U.S. and I, I, I've been reading CAST, so if you haven't read it, you should check it out. But the U.S. has created this caste system based on race. I mean, we are, as Black people, now Black men are a little bit higher than the Black women. So it's like this caste system has been built to keep minorities down, especially Black people. And it, it bothers me because it shouldn't be that way. And until we fix that caste system and the people in it and that don't want to let it go, we're going to be thinking this. If my daughter gets diagnosed with diabetes when she's 23, like I did. She's going to be singing the same exact song that we're singing right now. So to hear 40%, I'm not shocked. I'm pissed. I'm angry. I'm upset. It's heartbreaking. It's exhausting. It's yeah. very exhausting. That it is. So I'm going to move on to a question about clinical trials. So look at everybody. Everybody's like, mm, clinical trial. <laughs> so we know they are important. And Michelle, I'm going to slant it to you. We know that clinical trials are important because when we are given these medications and people who look like us or from our same ethnic, racial <laughs> makeup have not been a part of the clinical trials, they may have different effects on us. But then when they put out the call, you know, the need for the clinical trials, then there's a lot of distrust, right? Um, so thinking about BIPOC communities, primarily looking at what has happened to Black Americans in the U.S. medical apartheid system, how do we address this, the historical atrocities, but at the same time, the need to have Black people and many people in the BIPOC community participate in these clinical trials. Michelle? Yeah, this is a, this is a big issue. One of the things that um, we have in where I am at in Utah is uh, there's a really strong community health worker um, program, um, especially for the Hispanic community, which is the community I worked with on a recent trial where we, um, we provided Spanish speaking Hispanic individuals with type two diabetes, not on insulin yet, with both a CGM technology and an online peer support community. And, you know, first off, there's this assumption that maybe this population wouldn't be interested in those two things, but I can tell you that they loved it. There are a couple of things that made it work for us. Um, number one is we use those community health workers to help us recruit. And the community health workers don't just recruit for anybody. They bet you as a researcher to know, are you going to take care of our community? Are you going to stay with our community? This cannot just be a one and done. Um, and are you looking out for the community as far as, um, you know, if you do provide a control, you can't just give people nothing. You have to give them something because there's already this distrust. The second thing that we did was we hired a research assistant who lives in the same community where we were recruiting from. So they were, um, you know, the person we had is a pre-med student who's going places um, bilingual and um, 
the community, the, the participants could really relate to him because he knew exactly where they were coming from. And I think what um, was what really shocked a lot of people was within um, two months, we had half of our sample recruited um, and half of the sample had a high school education or less was making $35,000 or less and two thirds were uninsured. So this was a population that's not easy to recruit, but I think with the methods um, you, that we put in place, it was doable. But I think that you, you can't just, um, you have to build that community engagement. And so this was not, you know, even though I was the lead on this study, there were several studies that came before me with the community members, with people that were on the team that really led up to this research happening. So I can say that community engaged research takes time. You can't just hop into a community and start doing research. Um, so uh, you need key players that are willing to um, help you, but in order to help you, they must trust you. And in order to trust you, they must know that you're doing good for the community and you'll stick around. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I agree. Anyone else? Chime in. I was going to say for me, um, I was actually thinking about the COVID vaccine, right? Because I see that they're looking for people. And I was like, no. And this is why I said, no, we're going to go back to that 40%. Hmm. That 40%, we're going to look at the Tuskegee Airmen. We're going to also look at Henrietta Lacks and the, the stupid idiotic doctor that did what he did to the black women and the slaves, the OB doctor. Now, we are, we are in 2020, 40% are dying and they're mostly minority. So why would I trust this vaccine? And I know there are different practices and IRBs, I know that, I know that that exists but I just don't trust the system enough with my health care. Now my own individual doctors, not a problem, but when it comes to mm -hmm. research and everything, it freaks me out. And another thing I'm gonna tell you that makes me upset about all these clinical trials is that they're always in the suburbs. They're always at the good hospitals. They're not in the inner cities and they're not on bus lines. So the people that can benefit for getting free insulin during a clinical trial, they can get to the place. Yeah, yeah, they can access it. So if you want more people of color to participate in clinical trials, put it on the bus line, put it in ways that people can access it. Do it, yeah. include over so they can get there. I mean, so it's like, yes, these clinical trials are awesome, but once again, it's going to help those BIPOCs that are in like that 1%, but it's not going to help the majority because yeah. they're not going to be able to access it. So yeah. it's like, okay, we're talking about these things, but the social determinants of health is real. No yeah, matter, true. you know, let's look at the big picture and it's the system. Once again, clinical trials. I'm looking at UC Davis. I'm looking at all these big name hospitals. And if people don't have access to it, that need it, and you want to have them, so you say, make it accessible for more people of color to be able to feel comfortable to participate in it. Yeah. Manny and Courtney, did either one of you sign up for the COVID clinical trials? For me, I was on my way to do so. Absolutely not. I haven't even heard of that. And then I saw Get not. Out again. I, I, I did not, uh, but I... I want to... My child is a guinea pig. No, no. <laughs> I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that's a, a very a very fair point, quite frankly. Uh, and, and like, uh, I... I, I was just uh, reminded when when Michelle was talking about uh, being inclusive in clinical trials is more work, and I I I think that that, that is another aspect. That there's the element of trust that that has been alluded to. That's you know very real and very uh, fair. Uh, but but <laughs> this this element of of intentionality, right? And this is a uh, I mean, left to its own devices, you know, the, you know, 
things will find a way to to happen. The problem is that often they will go through to the path of least, least resistance, right? So the path of least resistance might be, you know, uh, holding the trials in 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 hubs or like uh, I I participated in the project baseline study by Verily. Uh, in I mean the concept is phenomenal, but like there, there's a fundamental flaw. I mean the people that are part of it, like project baseline is essentially uh, conducted with the aim of uh, mapping the human health fundamentally, and and so it's it's a verily is a Google uh, company, so they're you know that's their attempt at you know capturing that slice of of the world so to speak. Now that makes sense. The problem is there there are two hubs for recruiting are one in Stanford and one in Duke. So you know the two coasts uh, both like relatively uh, affluent area. So again, to Sharice's point, if you really want to map human health, like you, can, you cannot just limit it to uh, the, the two coasts. Like there's, there's a whole bunch of people in the middle and, and, and even within the coast, like you, you, there's something to be said about like going out of your way. So, I mean, my perspective as it uh, relates to inclusion is in the workplace, you know, uh, that's an area that I've been very focused on and passionate about for many years. And, and it doesn't happen automatically. You have to be intentional about it and, and, and push for change. Uh, otherwise, change doesn't happen automatically. Yes, thank you so much for that. We are going to go now to our chat in Facebook. I think we have two burning questions for our panelists. Jordan. Absolutely. So the first question let me just locate it here. Um, so this is from Mila on Facebook. And she says, I'm curious about what you all would say to people who say that these systemic issues don't exist or deny that this is happening because of race, ethnicity, economic status. Check your privilege, yo. <laughs> there you go. Check it. Because yeah. even though I am a black woman, I still know that I'm privileged because of my access to healthcare and the opportunities that I have. So for me, as a black woman who is privileged, I still understand that the world doesn't revolve around Sharif Shockley. I understand that there are people out there who are struggling, black, white, so let's talk about people in rural communities, Native Americans, people are struggling, people are dying. Check your privilege, do some research, because if you understand any history, not that was taught to you in school. The accurate history. The accurate history, you will see and you will truly understand the facts are the facts and the data is the data. And in this case, the facts are there and the data is there to prove it as well. So check yeah. your privilege. I agree. And go on Instagram and see how many people have CGMs. They all have something in common and it's not just wearing a CGM. Yeah. Yeah. Those Ooh. who don't understand or who say, or say they don't understand why we think it's about race or that it's about race. Those are the ones that don't seek to understand. And it, uh, this is another area where it goes beyond healthcare. It's in classrooms, it's in schools, it's in prisons, it's in housing, it's in employment, it's everywhere. And those are people that don't seek to understand it. Just like Sharik said, check your privilege. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Sorry, Manny, I cut yeah. you off. No, um, thank you for, for saying that. I, I, I wanted to offer the perspective of like, yes, I'm a Latino, I'm also a white guy. And like the, the, the times following the the, the death of, of George Floyd, uh, I think where a a point where we uh, as a nation and and many of us who have not lived with you know the realities that growing up or going to school or being a prof a black professional means like uh, found ourselves having to look very deep inside of us 
And, and one thing that, that I took from, from, from this very painful extended period is it, it's, it's not new. It's just an extension of something that has been going on for, for years and years was that it's really not enough to not be racist. You, you have to be anti-racist. And that is, again, something that takes time, effort, and intentionality. You, it, it, comes, it comes down to like really going out of your way and, and, and not eating the news and the information you're spoon-fed, but making sure that you look beyond the obvious and understand what others are going uh, through. Uh, so to the point of privilege, like we're we're connected here. We're having this conversation. Like we, we have internet, we, we're, we're safe. We have a CGM, we have access to insulin. We like that, that's, that's not the norm. You know, we just said 40% of people would have died of COVID had diabetes. So that's, that's not right. Right. No, just echo, go ahead. I was just going to echo what everyone has said, but I think doing the work. So, um, a lot of people who don't think it exists haven't even tried to explore all, mm -hmm. you know, history like like Sharice is talking about. I echo that the cast is a great book. I'm reading it as well. And I think that if you haven't even tried to do the work, you how can you even say that something exists or doesn't exist? And so I think really, really committing to doing the work so that you can see for yourself what's there. Yeah, and I was going to also uh, say this back to education, back to what Courtney said, is that, you know, a lot of people are donating to, you know, racial injustice programs and keep doing it. But also think about those inner city programs that will help kids rise up and rise above the system, right? I was fortunate to have a mother who raised five kids by herself. But she always made sure that we had, and she always made sure that we didn't become a victim of the system. And a lot of people don't have that. So try to invest in your local communities and under-resourced kids that don't have resources so that they can rise above the system that's put in place to make them fail. Yep. And you. individuals who are trying to do it, like trying to open schools. All right, thank you. <laughs> So that was one question, Jordan. What was the other one? How's our chat doing? Our chat is doing good. Um, Tiana had a question. Um, and it was, so on a more positive note, I think, you know, how do you think HCPs can gain trust from people who may not have built that trust right now? What, what can they do to make this better? I would like to say that I, um, I, I like Michelle's answer. You know, when she was just curious about that, like, I wish someone would ask me about what is Hoppin' John? You know, what is, you know, Kalaloo and, you know, and Saltfish, these kinds of things. I've never been asked that, you know. So, Michelle, yeah. can you take well, it away? I think one thing that's really important is in order to build trust, it can't just be about the numbers. It has to be about the human. And so... Do we need to talk about A1C and like how to drive that number to a certain level on the first visit? If you really want to build a relationship, I would argue no. I think that really you have to build that relationship. And what does that mean? Well, I have to know what, what your major is in school if you're in college. I have to know, you know, um, what position you play if you're on the baseball team. I need to know, um, you know, who lives at your house? Are you taking care of two elderly parents in your home? I have to know all of those things so that I can better understand you so that I can better understand how to help take care of you. And I think that, um, you know, healthcare providers um, were measured on metrics, you know, how many of our patients have an eye exam, how many of our patients had a foot exam. So there's these measures that were that are um, that are constantly being evaluated and assessed. And so I think that um, that puts pressure on healthcare providers. But I think in the end, um, if you build that trust, people will want to come back to you. And if they come back, you can handle those other things at a next visit. So I was gonna say, here's one more thing too, because we're putting a lot of this on healthcare providers and it's, it's a partnership. We live in a world where more people will ask questions about this iPhone, the Samsung TV and everything else. 
If we can feel comfortable making a purchase, we have to get out of our shell and speak up and be engaged in our healthcare too. Because it's like Manny said earlier, doctors have a lot on their plate. Endocrinologists, they're few and far between. But at the same time, we have to meet them halfway. And yes, the healthcare professional has to make us feel comfortable. But if I need to get my car fixed and there's only one Toyota place up the street for me to get my car fixed and I can't stand that person, I'm still going to go get my car fixed. And I'm going to tell you why I can't stand you and why my car needs to be serviced. So with that being said, we can't just leave it on healthcare professionals. We have to take responsibility and be just as comfortable with that person, our doctor, that we are with that person at Best Buy to share information as well. It's a two-way street. But, wow. but, sorry, I know we're wrapping up, but not everybody is as comfortable with, with or as aware of the questions that they have. You don't know what you don't know. And right. you can't ask questions if you don't know. And I think that when using the phone example, we've had smartphones forever, it seems like. So people know the questions to ask. They ask about the camera. They ask about how many pictures can it hold. They ask about the internet. They ask about so many things because they know it and they're comfortable with knowing it. But, it's, and I'll use myself in, as an example. I can advocate so hard for my son and I know the questions to ask and I know what to advocate for and what I should expect when he goes to his visits and all of that. Number one, because I'm privileged to be an educator and I educate myself and then I come to these appointments with that. But then you have patients who they're not as comfortable and they're not as knowledgeable. So yes, I do agree that it can't all be on the healthcare professionals. However, there has to be like some medium. So that's where the community resources come into play. That's where other advocates come into play to help provide parents of children with diabetes provide newly diagnosed patients with the resources and the language and the knowledge that they need to be able to speak up for themselves and to be able to advocate for themselves. So I do agree that it can't be all on the, the doctors, but you don't know what you don't know. Correct. And that's why it's important <laughs> to have the people with diabetes and peer support and beyond type one, diatribe and yep. all these organizations yep. out there. And of course, your fabulous organization. Chase um, diabetes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's that's where the balance is, is that like yeah. Michelle, and I know we got to wrap up, so I'm sorry, beyond type one. But it's one thing that I really appreciate about Michelle is that if she has a, a patient and she will actually call and say, Sharice, I have this patient who I think you could help. And can you just talk to her? And she don't, she doesn't go on Pacifics, but I give her permission to get my phone number to her patients so they can call me and they can get one-on-one -on -one peer support from me. So we need more healthcare professionals that's willing to engage and interact with the patient community locally or online to make it happen. So I think that what you said was like the perfect ending and bam, that's where you marry it with that online community, that peer support and bringing those professionals together with people with diabetes who are willing and wanting to share. I think Sharice was trying to take my job as moderator. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, you know, I just... wasn't. <laughs> I have the last say, thank you very much. <laughs> No, fantastic, fantastic um, job, everyone. I think that was pretty much wrapping up. Any final thoughts, anything you want to say, Manny? We are going I, to go out. I wanted to share a resource that I've uh, become exposed to that is very pertinent to this conversation. It was just put out recently by ADA, and it's a program called Health Equity Now. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll just mention that it's diabetes.org slash health equity now. Uh, it's, it's exposing a lot of these things and, and, and attaching numbers to uh, and, and context to, to, to the, these very, very stark realities and also tools to engage uh, from an advocate standpoint uh, to, to begin changing them. So health equity now on the ADA website. Okay, well, I think it's time for us to wrap up now. Thank you very much, panelists, for doing such an excellent job tonight. I'm going to pass it back to you, Jordan. Awesome. Thank you, Felissa, and thank you all so much. 
I learned so much tonight and I just really appreciate the openness from all of you. I'm not at all surprised, but really just amazing. So, and thank you to all of you that joined in the Facebook chat and here in the Zoom webinar. Um, we're so happy to have you all. As a quick reminder, we have one more September summit next week. We're gonna be talking disabilities and complications in diabetes and we'll have another great group. Um, I just want to thank our supporters one more time. You know, September summits are made possible by support from the JDRF Beyond Type 1 Alliance and sponsors One Drop, Roche Diabetes Care, and Xerus Pharmaceuticals. So thank you to this group again. Thank you all for joining, and we'll see you next week.